we can only use the squares that we have. So we can't control the actual real outline. We have to kind of get it as close as possible with the, with the width of the squares that we have. So these are the, some of the advantages and disadvantages between raster and vector. Vector can come in a lot of different formats. The simplest is a point. We just have points. Each point is a value. In this case, we have Rwanda fires from 2002 to 2012. Each incidence of an observed fire in 10 years, represented by a point. Here, we can show Kenyan grasslands in what's called polygons. What is a polygon? It's a shape, multiple-sided shape, right? So each one of these shapes represents something different about Kenyan croplands. Each color represents a different crop, or each color represents a different type of irrigation. And we can also use lines, in this case rivers. So these are the three types of vector data. So when we're thinking about the data that we want to analyze, a lot of times we know exactly what format it should be. What format should a road be? A line which is vector, right? A river, it's vector. Okay? Population density. Probably a raster, but maybe it could be both too. Okay, we could just show a square of different population densities as well with a vector. So when we're thinking about the data types, we can be thinking also about the best type of data that would be represented by that, that variable. How am I doing on time? We have till 10.30? I've been till no, 11. 11, okay. So here's the Kenyan croplands that we were looking at earlier. One of the other aspects of vector data is that you have this feature table. Each feature, we call a feature, is one unit of the data set. So maybe this row here, pineapple, is orange. So this row maybe is this area here. Whoop, that's that whole row. Row one is all right here. And depending on the data set, we can have an infinite number of variables to describe that that crop. In this case, we know that this is a pineapple area. The county is Nyeri. It's irrigated water, so it's not rain fed. And we have the area in square kilometers. We could also have whether or not it's Maasai land. We could also have whether or not um, it's owned by the government. We could have an infinite number of variables in this feature table to describe this area. So this is always, this vector data is always accompanied by a table. And we'll show you how to open these tables to investigate the data that you see on the map. So this is the metadata that we were talking about earlier. Here's the Rwanda land cover that we saw earlier. The metadata tells us all about this data set. In this case, we have these different statistics. The maximum value is six. Now we don't have the information in the, in the metadata to tell us what six represents. Because raster data has to be numeric. So this can't say cropland, it has to be a number. But somewhere, wherever we got this data, there should be a legend table that says six represents cropland or six represents grassland. Eight represents urban. So in this case, the value that occurs the most is six. The mean value, which doesn't really mean much because it's categorical data. So when you have categories, the mean doesn't really tell you a lot about it. Okay, because the, the numbers could be anything. You're just taking the mean of crop, agriculture, and urban. It doesn't make sense, okay? But if this raster were to represent 
temperature, then these statistics would actually be a lot more helpful because we would know the mean temperature of Rwanda. Okay? Here we have the pixel size. In this case, each pixel is 0 0.0003. But it doesn't tell us the units. We have to know the units from the projection. And here the projection says long lat, which means what? It means it's degrees. Longitude, latitude is always degrees. Okay, so these units are giving us the units in degrees, which again, it's kind of useless for us because a degree of latitude and longitude is a different length of meters depending upon where you are on the planet. So you have to do a complicated calculation to determine how much meter this is. The computer will do that for you when you project the data into a different coordinate reference system. And it will give you these units in meters. And we're going to do that later today. Okay, but for now it's just important to know that each data set has this metadata. It tells you information about the data that's crucial to understanding what it actually represents. Any questions about that? Okay. So in general, raster versus vector, you have advantages and disadvantages. Raster, you don't need a coordinate for each cell. You only need to know where the first cell is and then you can put each cell in a row after that and line it up. So you don't need to store a coordinate for every cell because you know where the first cell is and you know that the next cell is five meters to the east or five meters to the west and it keeps going. Okay, so that helps save a lot of space when you have really big data sets. This is why global data sets are often stored in raster. Because you don't need to store a coordinate for every 42 million data points. That would be a lot of data and it would be too hard to store on your computer. It's really easier to compute different statistics because it's in a nice grid. Okay, it's really good for doing these quantitative analyses. And the high resolution data is very accurate. So we can know within maybe 30 meters what the value is. It can only represent one variable usually, although we can have data sets that have multiple rasters stacked on top of each other and they represent different variables. But usually a raster only represents one variable. Whereas the vector, as I showed you in the table, you can have a whole infinite number of columns that have different variables for the same area of land. You can't really represent linear features very well, right, because you have these blocks. So you can't outline in detail a feature very well. Uh, these high resolution data sets are really large. So you, your computer has to be able to store the high resolution data. Vectors. They're more aesthetic. That means they're more visually pleasing. We can look at the nice curvatures really well with, uh, with, the vector, with the vector data. Precise locations can be achieved with each point. Whereas with the raster, we can only go every 30 meters, right? So we may not get the precise location because we're limited by the length of the cell. Vectors you can go a millimeter and do another point. Another millimeter and do another point. Okay, so you can get very precise coordinates for each point that you have. But you have to store each of those locations if you want to use that data. So if you have a really big data set that's very precise, it's going to take up a lot of space. And the analyses can be more complex because the geometries are more complex. So you don't have a simple grid. The computer has to calculate the trigonometry between this point and that point in order to get the area. Okay, like we showed, you can count the cells in a raster and tell the area. 
But in order to get the same area for a vector, you have to calculate these complex geometries in order to get the same area. So it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more difficult for the computer to calculate some of these analyses. And with time, again, this is, these are things that really come with practice. So you have to sit down with the computer and you have to just try it. And you have to say, you know what, this isn't working with a vector. Maybe I should try it with a raster and see what happens. And when you do that, an analysis that took an hour with a vector can take a second with a raster. And the other way around too. So it's, it's a lot of practice involved in understanding what's best for each of these data sets. So how do we create these data? How do we create a land cover data set? How do we go from taking an image of the earth to saying, okay, this is forest, this is river, and this is cropland. The general way we do that is we take a satellite to measure these different light or energy frequencies. Okay, so the satellite measures the reflection of energy from the earth into the sensor of the satellite. It then computes the distribution of that energy. So on this, we have the wavelength of energy that was reflected. And this, we have the intensity or the reflectance. Each color is a category of land. So we knew that in this pixel, this was a building. We already knew that before. And the satellite is telling us that the building peaks at 550 nanometers of light. Whereas water has a really low reflectance at some of these other wavelengths. So when we know what the land is and we see the reflectance measured by the satellite, we can then turn that into a raster. We measure the reflectance across the earth. This cell looks like this. It gives a distribution like this. So it must be a building. It's here. This is a building because its reflectance looks like this. This area here, when we looked at it with the satellite, the light was reflected like this. So we know it's water. It must be water because that's how the light was reflected. And we can see each type of land cover reflects light in different ways. So that's how we go from an image to being able to say automatically just by the reflectant, the way the light is reflected, we know that this is a mountain, or we know that this is a forest. Okay, and each satellite and each instrument does this in a different way. It measures different wavelengths, it measures different energy frequencies, depending upon the question that that satellite has. So, when we look at remote sensing products, there's different levels that we can get. The zero level is the raw satellite data. This is almost never available to us unless you're working for the company that gets the data. Okay, this is data directly from the satellite. No processing involved at all. L1 is corrected data. They calibrate it to the sensors. They do adjustments known by some of the geometries that they know. Sometimes you can get L1 but mostly what you're getting are L2, L3, and L4. Okay, this is data that has been processed by the agency and corrected and calibrated for a given product. Okay, L2 and L3 are the raw data, the image that's been corrected. L4 is that image where they've done an analysis on it. So they've taken the image and they've said, okay, this is vegetation greenness, or this is land cover. So they've gone ahead and done this classification where they've taken the image and they've said, we know that this is forest, we know that this is water, or we know that this is this level of vegetation. These are these end products that we're usually looking for. And this is important because when we go into these agency websites to look for the data, they're going to have these indicators. 
This is an L4 type data. This is an L2 or L3 type data. Okay, just so you know what you're getting when you look at the different data types. So typically we're gonna be here. Okay, we want land cover, we want what the scientists have already processed. Unless we're really good and we've been doing this for a long time and we want to do our own classification and we know what we're doing, we can trust the scientists to do that for us and just we'll take the product that they give us, usually. Okay. So the way that they usually classify this, they do this classification for land cover, it can be either supervised or unsupervised. And Amelia is going to talk a little bit more about that later today and how we can actually help the computer choose which is a house, which is a forest, which is a river. Some satellites, they just let the satellite do everything. That's unsupervised. That means humans don't help the computer out because they trust the computer enough to be able to do it for us. But a lot of times we need to do these supervised classifications where there's actually a human being checking what's being classified and actually kind of training the computer to recognize what land cover is which. Again, I mention this because you'll see this in the data. And for a certain problem that you have, you may want supervised or unsupervised data. Okay, so land cover classes. Let's start as general as we possibly can. We're looking at the earth. What are the two things we see? Water. Water. Land. land. We can get a data set that gives us this. Water or land. Oftentimes we're probably going to want something else, right? Vegetation. What types of vegetation can we have? Forests. 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 Grassland. Grassland. Cropland. Crop Wetlands. Oh, sorry, I mixed one. We can have land that's vegetated or unvegetated, yeah. right? And with water, we can also have a vegetated water, a wetland, or an open, non-vegetated water. And then you guys beat me to this one. You can have either natural vegetation or human cropland vegetation. Unvegetated areas, it can be developed, so it can be a city. It can be barren, so maybe a desert, snow. Natural vegetation could also be a vegetated wetland as well. So sometimes there's a little bit of a crossover between these two. So a forest, a mangrove forest, is a forest and a wetland. Yeah. Right? So it can be both, depending upon how we want to classify it. Then we could have, as you guys said, forest, grassland, shrubland, tundra. Developed land can be pervious, meaning water can enter. So this is the soccer pitch down the hill. It's developed because we've cleared it and we play soccer on it all day, but the water can still kind of get through that soil. Or it can be impervious, meaning we've put pavement it's a road or it's a roof. Forests, we can go evergreen, deciduous. We can go broadleaf evergreen. We can go needle leaf evergreen. So we could keep going on and on and on up to the species if we wanted to. And so the point is, we could start very basic if we want, or we can get very detailed if we want. Obviously, it's going to be difficult for the satellite to recognize each species, but it's possible with human help. And we'll go over some examples. And depending upon these different levels, we can have an increasing number of classes. So we have these really detailed broadleaf, deciduous, evergreen, needleleaf, uh, perennial grasslands, annual grasslands, very detailed descriptions of the vegetation. But we have a low level of standardization here. 
Okay, and, but, we, but we also have a high level of flexibility because when we start with a lot of details, we could always go back into just vegetated or unvegetated. Whereas we have a high level of standardization with a low number of classes. That means we can standardize the data sets with each other. So this is vegetated and the same data, many different data sets all say it's vegetated. So it's standardized. But we have low flexibility here because we can't go beyond that. We can't say it's a broadleaf evergreen and a needleleaf evergreen. So the point here is to just show that again, sometimes we have decisions to make. And what is the level of flexibility that I want with my data set? How, f how detailed do I really need to be for my question? If I'm asking questions about urbanization across Africa, all I really need to know is developed and non-developed. But if I'm asking questions about specific habitat types for a mammal species, sometimes I might really need to know what is the exact type of vegetation that that mammal species uses. So I'm going to need a high level of detail and flexibility there. So this is where it all began. Anderson classification system. This was done back in 1970s by the United States Geological Survey and they came up with these kind of standardized sets of land classes. And they said let's try to classify the landscape based upon if it's urban, agricultural, rangeland, forest, water, wetland, barren, tundra, or snow. And within each of those we can have these other different detailed types. So this is kind of where it started with these land classes. And from there, it's more or less maintained the same structure. But again, some people, they want to take it a little bit further and get more detailed. So most land use, land cover classifications are based on this. But we do have different local levels. This is an example from Myanmar. Myanmar. Here you have actually specific levels. Intact mangrove, degraded mangrove, rice, oil palm, rubber. So somehow these scientists have gone to these locations and they've been able to confirm that these species are here in these locations. And they've done a supervised classification from satellite data to train it to recognize what's rubber. What's oil palm? What's a mud flat? So this is really great for their study area because they have a really nice map of their specific area. But do you think they could take this classification and apply it to Benin? No. It's a totally different system. And it would get it wrong. It would classify rice where there was corn and it would classify corn where there was soybean. Because it needs to be trained, when you're this specific, it needs to be trained to a very specific location. Here's another example. This is, where is this? South Africa. South Africa. Okay, we have specific data, specific species, specific land types, sugarcane, orchards. So they've used a very specific classification that, that, was, that, that was useful for their questions that they had. And if you have a very specific question, using the methods that Amelie will teach you, you could classify a land cover map to answer the specific questions that you have. If you need to know about a very specific land cover type. Tanzania, Arusha. Here's the satellite data. Here's the classification. Okay, and they've, they've got a really high number of, of classes. Residential. Four different levels, five different levels of residential. Based upon the amount of impervious surfaces they have. So they're probably, this is a very specific to urban systems. They want to know about urban systems. So they want to know very detailed information about the types of urban lands that they have in Arusha. 
so where do we find the land cover sources that we need? Landsat is probably the most common and the most far-reaching data that, that land cover scientists have used. Because it goes back to the 1970s and they've had now, I think, nine missions. So nine different satellites all taking these images of the Earth and providing this data for classifications. This is the, the, the wavelength that Landsat produces. It gives you information of all of these wavelengths. Where is the visible wavelength here? Anybody know? Where does, it, where, does, where does the visible wavelength cover? 400 to 900. Yeah. So Landsat is actually taking the majority of its information outside of the visual spectrum. We can't even see the wavelengths that it's collecting. Most of it's collecting in the infrared, heat, temperature. It wants to know how heat is reflected by the Earth. Why? Because plants reflect heat differently than pavement does. It's a different color sometimes. What if you have green pavement and a green forest? If you're just using the visible spectrum, you don't know the difference between the two. But we do know that a pavement is probably much hotter than a forest. So we can use the infrared spectrum to know the differences between the two. Okay, and the data that we'll use with Amelie later, we'll use some of these different spectrums to make those determinations. So, as I said, there's a number of different wavelength bands that they have, and they have different resolutions. So we have, you know, the visual, the visual spectrum has up to 15 meter resolution. That's really good. That's about as good as it gets for satellite data. So I can have one cell from here to the back wall. One cell from the satellite. And it can tell me that this is a piece of tile flooring. And that over there is grass. It can tell the difference between this and that. Okay, so it has a really nice high resolution. But 30 is more typical. That's only in the one small band of wavelengths. Most of them around 30, which is still pretty good. And it's about as high as we get. So a lot of the Landsat level two and three products, we get the surface reflectance, which wavelengths are being reflected. Then they also calculate these vegetation and moisture indices, temperature, snow cover, and burned area. So you can get those directly from Landsat. There's also people that separately use Landsat data to make their own classifications. And you can get those as well, but they're kind of external. So the Landsat team doesn't produce these, but other people use Landsat data to produce these. Okay, so it's important to know the difference between those. MODIS is another really popular one. And this is great because it comes straight out of the machine classified. So they don't have to do anything, you don't have to do anything. It's the, the data that they give you is classified data. So it has a certain number of classes Water, vegetated, urban, veg uh, cropland, forest land, grassland, and you get that data straight from the website, already classified. So this is a really popular one that a lot of people use. The European Union, the, sorry, the European Space Agency has also produced a really nice global land cover map by their Climate Change Initiative Project, and this is the one that we'll use in the exercise today. So they have three different time periods. So this is great because we can calculate change for 10 years or for the past five years. 37 different classes, but the resolution is a little bit lower than some of the other ones, 300 meters. So we can only tell the difference between 300 meter parcels of land. Question. I'll just add one thing. So I think this is very important, the resolution. Eh? So if you want to study deforestation, 
of forest encroachment in the savanna or savanna encroachment in the forest. Do you think you can use this 300 meter resolution? It's probably not going to show you. So think about the resolution because it's very important. Even the one he showed before, sorry, the modis. I mean, this is great. Eh? The detail is also great because you, but you see here, the problem is that it only started in the year 2000. So you cannot go back to the 70s eh, to see what was there before. I mean, it's okay, but it's not so old. And the other problem is, again, the resolution, eh? up to a kilometer. Are you going to see deforestation? I mean, except if it's a very big deforestation, <laughs> you will not see. So when you think about the purpose of your study, it helps you select which data you may be wanting to use. Because, I mean, if I use MODIS and say there was no deforestation, Maybe it's not that there was no deforestation, it's maybe that I just select the wrong type of data for my study. So just keep that in mind, guys. That's a good point. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good point. This is a more recent one uh, produced by uh, the United Nations in China. This is a good, uh, decent resolution, 30 meters. And they have two time periods, but they only have 10 classes. So you don't, wow. So you don't get a lot of the flexibility that you would get with the other ones, but you do get a really nice resolution. Okay, I don't really see a lot of people using this. I'm not sure why. Um, I don't know, I think maybe Western scientists, want, they want to use Western satellites and, you know, I don't read Chinese literature, so maybe they're using it, I'm not sure. But uh, but it's available and it's free, so you can you can get it if you want. What is it called? Globeland Thirty. Maybe the problem is the ten classes. Eh? Yeah, it's only ten classes, so you you won't know differences between forest types or grassland types. What about accuracy? How accurate are these data sets? Right? I mean, they're calculating land cover across the entire globe. You think they're always getting it right? Probably not. So this is an assessment of how accurate each land cover data set has been throughout Africa. MODIS globally has the highest accuracy, and this is another reason a lot of people like it. But the highest accuracy is 75%. So that means only 75% of the cells are actually spatially accurate for that land cover type, according to this paper. And in Africa, it's even lower but it's still the highest in Africa. Some of the other ones have much lower accuracies. At least they're above 50%, <laughs> right? But also what's important here is where each one is most accurate. Okay, for, wow, okay. For Rwanda, it's MODIS. And maybe a little bit of globe land into Tanzania and Kenya. Okay, and you can see where they're being accurate. Of course it's accurate in the Sahara. There's no question about what's there. And of course they're pretty accurate in the Congo because they know it's mostly forest. But they do get it wrong in different places. Places like Botswana and South Africa, there's a lot of diversity there and habitats. So it's hard to get it right sometimes. Okay, so just be aware that these data sets aren't perfect and they do, they're not accurate all the time and you need to know where they might be more or less accurate. So applications, of course, land cover change. We want to calculate deforestation. This site uh, calculated most of deforestation in the past 100 years has occurred in West Africa and a little bit in East Africa. Okay, 22% deforested across tropical Africa over the last 100 years. Urbanization. Where is urbanization growing? These are the places that are likely to urbanize by 2030. Lake Tanganyika, I'm sorry, Lake Victoria, West Africa. So this helps us know where to put our resources when we're trying to contain urbanization and urban sprawl. Ecosystem services. 
in, South, in Zambia, South Africa, and Tanzania, on the left is the ecosystem service hotspot with green being high and purple being low. And then this is the degradation with red being high and green being low. So we, we look at the two. Here's a high level of ecosystem services and a high level of degradation. So this is an area that we might need to focus on for conservation. This is a great application of land cover. Mapping the, the differences between ecosystem services and the changes that we see in land cover. Habitat coverage uses land cover because they use specific habitat and forest types and savanna and grassland types to predict, in this case, mammal species. Highest in the tropics, Africa, endemism, really high mammal endemism in these parts of Africa using just land cover habitat types. Now again, this is published it made it through peer review. Is it accurate? We have to always question it, okay? So just always keep that in mind. It looks great, it's a beautiful map. But always question whether or not, where these numbers are coming from and whether or not we should really believe them. This is my own from Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. I don't know if you guys heard about this two years ago. Devastating hurricane. We flew a drone over mangrove sites before the hurricane and after the hurricane. And we used the classification to tell us which was alive vegetation and which was dead. So this allowed us within a couple months of the hurricane to produce a map of where mangroves had died across the island using our supervised classification. We can't wait for the government to give us the classification we had to do it ourselves because we needed to be quick to understand where the biggest changes were. So this is another really good application, rapid assessment of how land is changing. Climate change, temperature differences due only to land cover change. So when you clear an area of forest, the temperature is going to change. When you urbanize a, a landscape, the temperature is going to change. So we can use land cover to predict climate change. So, land cover and land use is very important for a lot of reasons, as I just showed. Natural resources, agricultural resources, climate. There are limitations. We need to understand projections. We need to understand resolutions. We need to understand accuracies. We need to understand the different data types and which data types are best for this and which data types are best for that. The classifications can be very general they could be very specific. It depends on the question that you have. And of course, again, the accuracy. It, it varies, and it depends on your location. Okay, so I'd like to note I'm four minutes early, and uh, pretty good on timing, if I do say so myself. <laughs> but we do have time for questions. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, shoot. <laughs>